Bob just celebrated your 50th. It is 50th anniversary. Yeah, in the spring, right? Yeah. yeah. And we're, I think we're 50, 54, 55, I should know this, but I don't. 62, you guys are 67, so we must be 55. So, <laughs> the art was started by parents and kids with disabilities who wanted their children in school and learning alongside their non-disabled peers. So that's the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. IDEA came out of that. And the ARC has continued to advocate from a group of parents, so as I said, over 650 chapters nationwide. So we're a very large organization. And Virginia is a very active organization. We must provide advocacy services. So you're sitting in Ally, you're sitting in the Advocacy Center here at the ARC of Love. We must provide information and referral and follow the mission statement, which is to advocate for the civil rights of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And then after that, every ARC does what, what its membership um, needs. And so from all the information, referral calls and emails and walk-ins and workshops and things like that, we learn what people are in need of and then create programming around it. So here you have the, the Aurora School. You, well, I mean, you can say what you have to yeah. <laughs> I'm Eileen Shea, from the director of the Advocacy Center. Um, so we have the Aurora School, which is a private day placement. Um, so if your child's not receiving a free and appropriate education in the public school system, Aurora is one of those private placements that's an option. We have um, Open Door Learning Center, which is a preschool that is for, it's deliberately intentional, so it is children with disabilities and neurotypical children that are great peer models for them. We have the Advocacy Center, we do IEP consultations, um, programs such as this, um, just general information referral for just about any topic that relates to disabilities. Um, and also a lot of advocacy work with the school systems and really for housing, anything that relates to disabilities. We just opened a program called Ability Fitness, which is a gym for people with um, developmental disabilities, spinal cord injury, stroke rehab, um, that's a very cool, like open nine to five right now, place to exercise. And our latest program that we just had a grand opening for about two weeks ago is the War Behavior Clinic. And it's basically ABA therapy, speech and OT, things that um, kids might get in the Aurora School but open to the general population. And we are in the process of figuring out insurance and billing to be able to bill for ABA services there. That was going to be my question. Insurance. Yes. That's always the question. So that's what they do here. What we do with the Arc of Northern Virginia is, <clears throat> in our footprint is Fairfax County, Falls Church City, Arlington, and Alexandria City. They, we have um, DD Waiver Case Management, so the Developmental Disability Waiver Case Management Services. We have Advocacy Services. We have a transition programming. We focus a lot of transitions, whether it's um, from birth into early intervention, or early intervention into the school system, or exiting the school system, the whole way across the lifespan. And we have these um, different transition points that are updated annually, and those are available hard copy in our office if you wanted to come in and get them, or online, you can download them. And we've also just translated those through our grants of five different languages, into five different languages. So Spanish, Chinese, and I'm not going to remember the other ones. Vietnamese, Hispanic, Korean, Spanish, Chinese, Korean, I don't remember. Arabic, and I can't remember what the fifth language is. I'll, I'll learn it one day. I'll remember to go back and check. But that's really cool, too, because this is all information that people are asking us about constantly, and we're trying to get it out to other people, and not everybody has internet access, or is internet savvy, or you know, web savvy, or computer savvy. So it's good to have hard copies available, as well as um, electronic copies. And then we have um, the travel training program. So you may have seen the travel training, some things in the newspaper out at the airport at Dulles where you can bring, the family can come and basically you go through the entire trip, so to speak, from the time you get to the airport till getting into the airplane. You don't take off, but you're on the airplane and it's everybody that's involved, including the volunteers and family members. So the kids with disabilities, or anybody that has difficulty traveling, getting into the airport, going through the airport, getting on an airplane, being in an airplane, it's a good way to expose them to that so that they're comfortable. And then we have the Special Needs Trust Program. 
So the special use trust program is different in that we serve any disability. It's not only IDDD, it's any disability. And we serve all of Virginia, not just our footprint. So we are the ARC in Virginia, Maryland, and Washington, D.C. that has a special needs trust program. And there are 20 other ARCs throughout the United States-ish that have trust programs as well. And they may serve only their state, or they may also serve other states too. So the, and the trusts are um, transferable transportable or portable, you can keep the trust in, in Northern Virginia and move to Colorado if you wanted to. That's not an issue whenever it's a trust through our trust program. So that's what we do. I have been at the Ark of Northern Virginia for, this is my 13th year. I started in this position as director of trust when it was created in the fall of 2009. Before that, we just had, we had a trust program, and if somebody needed a trust, then we'd establish a trust. But since uh, 2009, we've been marketing the program so that people know about special needs trust, because most families, there's data that says 80% of families don't even know about special needs trusts. So if you never heard of special needs trust before, you're in the majority. It's nothing new. And of those people that have heard of trust and have established trusts, statistics say, 50% of those trusts have been created incorrectly. So it's really important to work either with a nonprofit organization that knows what they're doing, or with an attorney, for example, elder law attorneys in Virginia specializing in special needs, that they know what they're doing. We work with a lot of estate planning attorneys as well. They're not specialized in special needs, so they contact us, and we assist with them, as well as many elder law attorneys that call us for information, too. So that is... Um, just important information to have. If you wanted to establish a trust with the ARC of Northern Virginia, we become the managers and then Key Private Bank is our trustee. And this is a presentation that Key Private Bank put on with us two years ago in Northern Virginia. So we had a, a, little, a small panel of presenters, a Key Private Bank and attorney and myself, who talked about real estate. And then Jeannie Cummins, who is at the Department of Behavior, Health and Development Services and who knows a lot about housing as well. As I mentioned, there are handouts over there. The ones with the red blocks on them, those are actually from Key Private Bank. So there's one about real estate. Key's also able to be the executor of your estate, as well as a successor trustee, which is something that wasn't offered in the past with our previous trustees. So this is exciting. My other was holding real estate. And a few other important documents over there, as I mentioned, from Special Needs Alliance website. On the Special Needs Alliance website as well, there is a trust administration document that gets updated annually. So if anybody's thinking of becoming a trust administrator, instead of having the ARC manage it, say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a trust and I'm gonna manage it when I die, my child's gonna manage it. There's information on there so that you have a good idea of what you're getting into if you were to administer the trust. So it's a good resource. I also have up here our first Friday, so we're going to have a Social Security presentation, but you're also having one. Is it December 13th, Eileen, where Derek's coming Yes. Here? So Social Security Administration presentation will be here. If you're closer to work in Northern Virginia Falls Church, it's there. And then in January, we have, the, we have DARS, the Department of Aging and Rehabilitative Services, Ticket to Work Partnership Plus, 1692B Medicaid Works, so they're coming to the Ark of Northern Virginia. It's always on a first Friday in Northern Virginia. Here it's usually a third Thursday, except for weather, for weather <laughs> intervenes, <laughs> and then we have to reschedule. So look at the calendars, and then um, ours are webinars, so you can call in. You can also RSVP, and even if you can't be there on the call, we'll send you the documents and the link to the webinar a couple hours after we've finished it, so it's really good. And then the whole annual schedule for our first Fridays is here, so you can see what's coming up if you want to grab that handout too. So you can either be in person, webinar, or get everything sent to you. And then what we have, what I also offer at the Ark of Northern Virginia are Trust Talk Tuesdays. So I do individual consultations, and that's where I was before I came here. And we have a 12.30 slot open, we think, on yes. today. 12.30 to 1.30 for a consultation. Um, Otherwise, the other option, and or, is Trust Talk Tuesdays at the Ark of Northern Virginia. I'm now doing it twice a month because it's become so popular. I speak 
primarily about special needs trust, then it, but then I open it up to everything else. So it could be guardianship, powers of attorney, housing, employment, special education, social security, whatever the topic is. So that's also free, and that's an uh, RSVP request on there too. So everybody, Pam, you got a copy of the PowerPoint that you came in? Thanks. So we're going to start with the PowerPoint. This is Key's PowerPoint, as I mentioned. I can um, tell you about what he does as our trustee when it's holding real estate. If you say, well, I'm going to have a private trust, and I'm going to go to an attorney instead and establish my trust, and I'm going to be the trustee, and when I die, somebody else is going to take it over. This is still important information because these are things you need to be thinking about if a trust is going to be holding that real estate. If you do it with the ARC of Northern Virginia and Key as our partner and our trustee, then they step in and do a lot of this work for you instead. So this is what we'll be talking about today, quite a few different things. And I can take questions as we go along, if anything arises, unless it starts to be too many questions, and then I'll stop and continue through the PowerPoint. So these are questions that you need to consider about real estate special needs. So should the special needs trust own or purchase a home for a beneficiary? And obviously there's no simple answer because there are many different factors that are involved when owning a home. When, when Key Private Bank has the home in trust, the house, when I say home, it could be a condo, it could be a, a trailer, it could be a, a mansion, it could be, it could be rental property. It could be mineral rights. It's not, it's not just bricks and mortar. Under real property, there's a lot of different things. But when they own, if we're talking about a home, then it should be paid in full before it's in the trust. Or maybe it's not paid in full, but we know that when the individual, that when the parent, say, dies, there's enough money in the life insurance policy to pay off the rest of the mortgage. And then there also has to be additional funds in the trust to maintain it property taxes, things like that. Jeannie Cummins, who I mentioned earlier, went to Fairfax County, Arlington, and Falls Church and asked them if they would waive the property tax if the home were in the trust and the primary individual in the home was the beneficiary, and they said they would. If a trust is, if the house is outside of the home, or if a, tr if a home is outside of the trust, excuse me, the county also has tax breaks if the individual with disabilities is the owner of that home. There's a difference between self-settled or self-funded trusts and first-party trusts. So, have any of you been to a pre trust presentation before? I know a couple of you have in the back. You can be covered. So, there are two types of special needs trusts. There's a family-funded trust. That's if the family establishes the trust. It's also called third party or family funded special needs trust. That's when the family establishes it and the money going into the trust is not the beneficiaries, is not the person with disabilities. So I established my, my ex-husband, so the girl's dad and I established two, I have two children with disabilities, a 19 year old and a 24 year old, forgot to mention. So we established trust for each of them at the Ark of Northern Virginia. So when we die, what's left in our estates, what's in the life insurance policy, the beneficiary designation is each of the girls' trusts, 50-50 split. So they get that. Now Robert has another daughter, so she'll get something as well, but for me it's most 50 /50. And whenever, whoever passes away first with my two daughters, the other daughter's trust gets everything, right? They pour into my other daughter's trust. And when she passes away, I've named what are called remainder beneficiaries, those people that will inherit if there's anything left in the trust. Okay? We established it, we're funding it, we determine what's going to happen to the money in the trust, both while the child is living and when the child passes away. Okay? On the self-funded trust, it's the individual with disabilities, the parent, grandparent, guardian, or court that establishes that trust. And when the, that beneficiary, when I say beneficiary, it's the person with disabilities. When the beneficiary passes away, either the money left in the trust goes to Medicaid, or if you've established it with the Ark of Northern Virginia, to the Ark of Northern Virginia's trust program, or Medicaid, and then to the heirs of the individual's estate. Okay, so there's a difference between 
me deciding what happens to the money in the trust when my girls are gone, and federal statute saying what has to happen to the money when the beneficiary passes away. So that's why it's important to look at it and, and not commingle money, keep the beneficiary's money over here and anybody else's money over there. Because if there's a home and property, if I have a house in, in the special needs trust and the beneficiary passes away, I want to make sure that, that when that home is sold, if that's what we're going to do with it, that that money goes to the people or organizations that I want to get, that I want to designate, right? I want control over that because it's my money. And on the self-funded trust, if I use money in the self-funded trust to buy a house, which we've done, because that's all the individual have is a self-funded trust, and then there's a Medicaid payback on that. Okay? <coughs> so we'll look at that, and we're going to make sure that we talk about whose money is going into the trust, make sure it goes into the correct trust, and then talk about who inherits after the fact. So that's why it's on there, self-funded versus family. So a lot of people, we have over 1,300 trusts that we've established to date. So a lot of people come to us directly to establish the trust. Our attorneys wrote the documents. They've been vetted in the courts of D.C., the Attorney General's Office in Maryland, and the Department of Social Services in Virginia. So we established the trust with the people. <clears throat> so I was just doing earlier, establishing the trust. And then we manage it. We oversee it. You've named people that, that are primary points of contact because they have to say how the funds are going to be spent. You say how the funds are going to be spent. We help disperse from it. We set up a budget. We're working together as a team. If you go to an attorney to establish that trust, you're the co-trustees, for example, and you've named successor trustees. So usually that's family that's, that's doing that. Back in the day when Robert and I moved back to the States, we... I was living in Florida and working in the disability world and met an elder law attorney. What did I know? I didn't know anything at that time, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, you need to get your, do you have your will? Well, we didn't have wills. We didn't have powers of attorney. We had nothing for ourselves. So she did our plans for us, our wills. So Robert and I each had a will. We each had powers of attorney. We each had advanced medical directives, giving the other one authority to make decisions. And then she said, you need special needs trust for your girls. So originally, we had special needs trust through an attorney. We were the trustees, and I, we named one of my sisters as a successor trustee. Now, Phyllis is eight years older than I am, and she continues to be eight years older than I am. So she's, <laughs> it's, uh, and she's out in Minnesota, which is great. But when I came to the Ark of Northern Virginia and learned about our trust program, I thought, why am I burdening my sister with that? If anything were to happen when they were minors, she and her husband were to get the kids which was great, because they're great, wonderful people, but giving her the burden of administering the trust, and doing the tax reporting and the account reporting and everything, seemed like it was just too much. So that's when we switched it to the Ark of Northern Virginia. So that option is available too. And the third place is if you go to a bank. We have a $250 bid. So there's a big difference between that too, right? <laughs> we're a little more family friendly. So, but we're always going to be working directly with you on whether it's self-funded or family-funded and so that you know the consequences of your decisions before you finalize anything. So that's when a home is subject to Medicaid payback on a first-party trust if the beneficiary had Medicaid. Right? If they didn't have Medicaid, well, there's no Medicaid payback. So who can tell me what a Medicaid payback is? I've been saying it now, and I didn't explain it. Medicaid payback. Go ahead, Eileen. Um, so, if, so if you start receiving Medicaid, kind of the counter starts counting with the beginning of the benefits that they give you, and they are tracking how much money that beneficiary has received in Medicaid funding. And so when they pass away, there's this huge, potentially huge tab that could be paid back if there are funds to pay back Medicaid with it. Correct. Exactly. So that's important. And that's why it's important not to come in with the money. Right? Because if you put their money into the family fund to trust, Medicaid can say, well, I don't see the difference between your money and their money. You're saying you spent their money first, but I don't know that, so you don't want to jeopardize that. So with the, the hypothetically, the trust that we have, which is a first party trust, and then we help the individual purchase a home, there's a Medicaid payback on it, and the person knows that. But the person is living in a house now that's their own, or the trust has it, and they're comfortable, and it's all great, right? 
and, and the person said, you know, that it is what it is, mm -hmm. right? I have somewhere to live, and when I die, it's not really going to matter because I'll be gone, right? Well, we want to make sure that that you're aware of what's what before you before you purchase. Is the home good to purchase? Can the home be adapted for use? Due diligence is critical. The trustee must make an economic decision as to cost. So they look at whenever we, I'll give you the, this scenario. So this house, we'll call the person Mary. So whenever Mary said she wanted to buy a home, the first home was a 3,000 square foot home. And, the, and Mary's you know, 26 years old and single. So first we had some educational discussions about that's a lot of home for somebody that's alone. Well, I want it for my family. Well, most people start with a small starter home. You don't jump into the biggest mm -hmm. house available. There's a lot of upkeep. There's maintenance. There's going to be a yard. There's a fence. You want a place with a pool. Who's going to take care of the pool? So she so said, okay, we can look at some other things. What Key did was they found a, they have a whole real estate department. They got a, a real estate agent. This is what you would be doing as well if you went solo on this, right? You get a real estate agent. And you look at properties and you go around and look at properties with this with the person or you're looking at the properties. And so the first property was too it had to be too many repairs. When the inspector went in, forty-five thousand dollars worth of repairs. And the the sellers were not willing to budge. And so we said no. We said this isn't a good this isn't a good purchase for you. Why pay over the you're paying? Top dollar, or they're asking top dollar already, and you're gonna have to put another 45000 into it. This makes no sense. Okay, so we move on, look at something else, present something. To the, she goes in, she picks one of these houses, go in, same deal. There's a lot of work that has to be done to it, and it's just not feasible. The person gets upset, you don't want me to get a house. Well, again, we want you to get a house, but you have to understand, you have to be able to maintain this house, and there have to be enough funds in the trust to maintain this house. And again, it's not a good idea. There were there are other issues wrong with with this house, and and I said to the person, I said to Mary, you know what? When I was buying my first time, I wish I had somebody like me and my colleagues to talk to me about buying a house because I didn't know anything going and buying my first house. You know, and I didn't really have anybody to talk to apart from the real estate agent and the mortgage lender. You think that they're really you know, they, they're looking at their side of it, right? They're not looking at it from our view. So we do a lot of hand-holding through the process in a good way. And then we went to another place, and she often, thank goodness, we're happy, and she's happy too for a condo, which meant less maintenance, so she's not responsible for that fence because she has pets or for the yard work and everything else. It's in a good neighborhood. There was some work that had to be done. The sellers were willing to negotiate on that. They dropped the price. So a lot of things happened. But Key was directly involved, and we were also involved in that purchasing process. Now, if you already own a home and you want to put it into the trust, then Key will also be involved, or again, you if you're doing it, because you have to make sure there's no lien on the house, right? It's not built on top of the gas station with big old gas tanks underneath. But there's that due diligence. You want to make sure it's a viable property. Who can live in the home owned by the trust? Anybody can live in that home. The trustee is involved in that decision making. So Mary's living in the home, and when, if when her boyfriend chooses or she law says he can move in, then he can move in. We'll expect him to be paying some type of rent to the trust. So that means it's not going to count as income against her, right? Because the house is in the trust. The trust owns the home. So she could potentially have a couple of roommates paying rent and then it wouldn't affect her benefits. We always ask if there are family members that want to help with the property management. If they do, great. If they don't, then Key again steps in and finds a property manager to assist. Good morning. Good morning. There's a PowerPoint up there, the second one over. SFI Medicaid rules strict as to use of funds. Again, we have to follow Social Security, if, there's, if the individual has SSI and Medicaid, we always follow their rules. Whether or not there's real estate, when you disperse from a special needs trust, you have to make sure that it's not jeopardizing the SSI or the Medicaid. Okay. If a special needs trust owns a home, will the beneficiary's SSI be affected? So it's not considered a resource because the asset is held in an irrevocable trust. 
So that means no, it's not been affected. If the trust pays for household expenses, that could reduce Social Security payments. So if somebody has SSI, SSI is meant for room and board. And on the Social Security Administration's website, in their what's called the Procedure Operations Manual Systems, the POMS, which we follow, which you follow when you disperse from a trust, because you don't want to jeopardize the SSI. It says that SSI is meant for rent or room and board. So that's rent, that's homeowners association fees, that could be homeowners insurance, electricity, utilities, waste, garbage removal, water, things like that. So Mary, for example, has SSI. And so we report to Social Security that there's a um, home in the trust because anytime something changes, Social Security needs to be informed. And so Social Security reduced her SSI by one third. So instead of getting the $750 a month, she's getting 500 because the trust is paying for all these other things. But it makes good sense. So she's getting $250 less a month, but the trust is now paying the utility bills, her homeowners association fee, et cetera, which is probably more like $1,000. Okay. When she switches to Social Security Disability, at some point in her life, whole other presentation next month, December 13th, uh, then it's not going to matter, right? The SSI doesn't matter because she'll have Social Security Disability instead. What happens if the family would like to sell the home? So ultimately, it's the trustee's decision. So if Mary's parents said, we want to sell that house, we think that house needs to be sold, she shouldn't be living there. They go, you know, be in her bonnet. Well, it's not their decision. The trustee, in, in collaboration with us, and we're talking to the beneficiary, we make that joint decision whether or not it's a good idea to sell that property. Maybe at some point, Mary's now 78, and she needs to move into something that doesn't have as many steps, and then you downsize, you sell it, whatever, but the money stays in the trust, right? Let's say we sold that condo and got her a rambler instead, right? It made more sense, because it can put in buy and sell the property in the trust. And the main thing, many factors to consider, but it's always the beneficiary's needs is always going to be a priority. So how does Key accept real estate? Key has a dedicated real estate manager's department covering the country. They say from Alaska to Maine, just meaning they go across you know, the northern part of the states. They also have other offices, other places. The real estate officer assesses environmental impact issues by inspecting the property. So they have this comprehensive environmental response, compensation, and liability information system. So that's, for example, and that, the example that I gave with the gas tanks underneath the property, that's something that they, would, they wouldn't want to purchase a home that was built on top of an old gas station property where the owners didn't remove those things. So they go in and have this officer, but they send in somebody to check that because you want to make sure that there are not any environmental impact issues. They do an annual review of the property. They verify appropriate insurance coverage. You can get on Key's master policy, so they have a homeowner's insurance that they offer clients that have trust with them. That, that's a very good um, policy, and it's a little less expensive than a normal policy because they have so many people using it, but you don't have to. So if, if you're not on Key's master policy, then those are the things they look, look at to make sure that the property is properly insured. Appraisals have to be completed within 90 days of receipt of the form to committee every three years. So their committee meets weekly. It has to be completed by an independent appraiser, and exceptions must be approved by, and I don't know what the, that acronym is, I can't remember, but it's a real estate real estate committee, that, that must be the trust real estate committee. Not only after the initial appraisal, may the appraisal be waived and has to meet the following. Beneficiary occupying the property. Expense will cause major hardship to beneficiary proportion to the share of the trust. Fractional interest and lease terms are five years or greater. So they have, again, their experts are going in and looking at this information to make sure that the beneficiary is in, the, in, the, in a good situation and the property is in a good situation as well. So that's their responsibility. 
they have this, and they just she lists. So Cindy McDonald, our, our main contact, one of our main contacts, if she lists these different um, responsibilities. Now compliance with ADA, that's really more if it's an apartment, right, or a condo. That's not a, a, an individual home. As far as I know, the individual homes and houses, we don't have to be compliant with ADA. It's more public, public properties. Okay. So there's a, their due diligence that they're doing. So key is the fiduciary they have responsibility for managing and conserving assets held in the trust. For example, the real estate. Expenditures over 15000 require two bids to submit. So this house that Mary was purchasing, it had to have a new, one of the houses they were looking at, the second one that we ditched, right? Because they weren't willing to <coughs> go down in price. It needed a, a new roof, and that was going to be over $20,000. So it didn't even make it to the real estate committee because we decided prior to, if the sellers aren't willing to budge, then we're not going to even look at that. Um, getting, you know, it doesn't have to go to the committee if the house isn't going to be bought anyway. But whenever that comes up, then it goes through the committee, $15,000 or more, unless it's an insurance claim. The real estate officer goes in and looks at it as well. So besides the committee, the real estate committee looking at it, the insurance or their real estate officer looks at it as well. If there are outside real estate managers, then they have to be approved by the committee. And then they expect to get accountants. So those are those property managers. If somebody chose to have a, an outside property manager overseeing the property, then there's a review and accounting that happens. It can be sold. So the house can be, something can be in the system. We have families that are leaving the home to the trust when they pass away, and then the trustee is going to be responsible for selling the home. Because they said they don't want their executor having to deal with the sale of the home, put it in trust, and then whenever it looks like a good time to sell, sell. So if the market's down, they want to sit with that seller, then they want to renting it until then. But they can sell, they can buy and sell. So we look at the trust agreements, obtain an appraisal, if one hasn't been completed over the last year, Review to see if there's court supervision, because sometimes some of our trusts do have court supervision. Um, that happens more often when it's outside of the special needs trust program with the ARC. Whenever there's private trustees, there's more often than not there's court supervision there. Less so with our program. That's usually if something hinky has happened, right? Within the trust. So maybe it was a, a million dollar trust or a five hundred thousand dollar trust, and all of a sudden there's only two hundred thousand dollars and then thirty thousand. That's when they're supposed to be. Um, consider updating the title examination. Consider a survey. So this is what they need. This is the process and the things that they think about or you would be thinking about before selling them. This is pretty common. Pre-listing activities, liability coverage, market value, listing activities, prior approvals. So whenever we were buying the house for Mary, there were comps. We asked for comps to see if the value of the home was appropriate. We asked for, we wanted to know, and the real estate agent would send us the houses that they were going to be looking at. After the fact, the real estate agent contacts us to tell us what homes they did actually go to and what, what they saw and where any of them would interest. So we were involved a lot in the process. This just goes on inspection contingencies. So has anybody bought or sold a house property at all? So you know that this, this is what you're going through when you're buying and selling. But you have to think about all these things. You have an inspection, clear guidance on contingencies, closing, post-closing activities. So we were involved in all of this. Review title insurance binder. We looked at the cost of the inspection, et cetera. We got copies of the inspection. And these are all the things that you would want. Closing and post-closing, executed deeds. Proposed HUD-1 for errors, review and cancel all utilities and outside contracts and report to the sale. So basically, Key Private Bank unburdens the family member from a lot of this work and any, if, if the property is in the trust that needs to be sold. So prior to accepting real estate, the real estate officer with the trust officer must verify that sufficient funds are available to manage the real estate. So this isn't costing anybody anything at this point. What costs is when they say the inspector goes in, then yeah, that, that's a fee. But the, the work that Key is doing at this point, they're not charging 
for any of that because it's just due diligence before you buy a property. So if there's not, if it does not reveal potential for contamination, property shall be approved and give that set of environmental piece of it. And then they go through all of these different records that have to be gone through before something's bought. Visual inspection of the sites and adjacent properties interviewed on on-site personnel and neighbors. So Deborah and her team, the real estate department, were going through all of these things. If there's contamination, they have course of action. So there's an annual property review with recommendations, provide tailored real estate solutions, purchase and sale of real estate, timely payment of real estate taxes, insurance, and other related expenses. So when we're, when we're the manager and Key is the trustee, the property taxes go straight to Key. So we have it set up on a recurring basis so that everything's paid on time. If, if you have property in your own trust, then whoever that trustee is or successor trustee is is responsible to, you know, for making sure that the bills are paid, right? Implementation and oversight and maintenance program, capital improvements, important. So if Mary came to me and said, I want to put on a sunroom and it's going to cost $20,000, then it has to go through this real estate committee that meets to make sure that not only do we know what cure deferred maintenance means. So I understand deferred maintenance, but I don't know what the cure part is. So that's a question for Sydney. But any of these oversight maintenance programs, capital improvements, informed improved real estate decision makings, we would send that to, to the committee. We'd first look at the balance on the trust to see whether or not she could afford it, because we have a budget and we know what money's coming in and how much is going out before we even send it to them. But if we said, okay, there's sufficient funds in the trust for this, is that something that's going to increase the value of the home, does it make sense? We would send it to the committee to take a look at it. So what are the advantages? So we have the expertise and experience in commercial properties. They rent, handle the rent collection of the property, which is, I think, really great whenever you have a house, if you have tenants in it, instead of the individual with disabilities having to go to the roommates to say pay the rent. You have somebody else asking for that instead. As a corporate trustee, their services allow for continuous management of the real estate assets in the event of death or incapacitation, preventing costly disruptions to beneficiaries or tenants, which is important, right? Because we don't want anything. One of the main things we talk about when we're talking about futures planning is putting your plan in place so that it's a smooth transition so that when we parents die, there's not a bunch of hiccups and bumps in the road that the person can use living where they're living, that they know to come to the Arkham or the Virginia to get their funding, or whoever, if it's somebody else that's overseeing the funds, so that there's a plan in place so that they're not saying, mom just died, I'm grieving, and by the way, where am I going to get my lunch money, or whatever, right? That would be my worry. How am I going to eat? But these, there's a continuous management of the service of the real estate, and the, and the bills continue to get paid and whatnot. And we talk to parents a lot about that because we are so used to taking care of so many things for our kids, it's important to transition those things out of our hands to the trust if, if, when, if and when possible so that automatic bill pay for the utilities, automatic bill pay for the cable, automatic bill pay for the cell phone, so that whenever the parent does pass away, first of all, we want to empower the individual as much as possible to, to take charge. But if they're not able to, then we want to make sure that everything's just flowing so that there's no disturbance and it just everything just continues as normal. Well. The real estate, so what are the disadvantages? The real estate is needed into the name of the trust for the benefit of the beneficiary. Someone may think that's a a negative. For Medicaid purposes, when it's a family fund to trust, it's a positive because then Medicaid doesn't have access to that money. But it is, it's a little more difficult to, to sell something that's in trust. I don't know if anybody has their own revocable trust, but if you have your assets in your own trust, and let's say you have your home in there, you got to do a little bit more in order to sell that property than if it was outside of the trust if you owned it. There's a little bit more paperwork. So 
some people say, well, I want to I control that. There's a lot of control that we have to work with here. You know, I want to be able to control the property. I want to be able to control the cell in the home. We well, have it outside of the trust then. But it's better that it's usually better that the beneficiary doesn't have their name on the property. The other thing, whenever there's, a, whenever it's in trust, or if there's a family fund, especially needs trust in general, liens cannot be put against it, and creditors cannot get at it. So just have that property, if you have that property in trust, that's a good thing, right? No liens against it, no problem, nobody can get at it. If there are tenants, as I mentioned, the fees go, the rent goes into the trust, it stays in the trust, it's not going to affect the beneficiary's benefits. And nobody can con them out of that property or marry them. They can get married, maybe. Maybe there's no guardianship. They can get married, but the trust owns the home. So if they were to get married and divorced, that ex-spouse does not have access to anything within the trust. So it's protected, right? They can't get to it, which is, I think, that's a huge bonus. I mean, we see, on occasion, we see people trying to influence our beneficiaries, try to get money out of the trust to pay for things. And we say, you know, we set a stop to that. If there's properties in the, in the trust, there's, they can't get to it. If there are not enough funds to support the home, then the trustee may take steps to sell. So that's a big concern. And that's why the real estate department is involved from the get-go, because if there's not enough money to fund the maintenance of the home, so we have a, a hypothetically, there could be another example where the individual went out and bought a house and now wants to put it into the self-funded trust because they use their own money. But there's not enough money to maintain that house at all. And so the real so key says no, we're not, we will not accept that property in the trust. It doesn't make any sense. It makes no sense. So now we're talking to the individual hypothetically about maybe selling that property and getting something that's actually affordable because this house was this big and they really needed a house this big. And then that could go into the trust because then there would be enough money to maintain it. But these, the, you know, the beneficiary hypothetically went out on their own and purchased something, which they should have you know, not, never done. Changes to the home must be approved by the trustee. And those are major changes. That's obviously not you know, wall color and carpeting and things like that, but it's bigger changes. What to remember, it's very important to work with a qualified supplemental needs planner when considering placing a home in trust. And Key Private Bank works closely with your attorney in the Ark of Northern Virginia to make the transition successful. These are the people that we work with at Key Private Bank. With the Debbie and Deborah is our main point of contact at, at Key. And then those are all the backup people that they have in place assisting them. So what we will do, um, conference, conference calls, either with Deborah or with Cindy or with both of them on the phone. So that's the quick, quick version of, of trust, real estate and trust. Uh, we've seen it. We were excited, actually, whenever he said that they would do this. SunTrust had been our trustee for 10 years, and then in 2015, they no longer wanted to be a trustee. They would only take money in and reinvest, and that's what SunTrust did. That was it. So when we went through the response to the proposal and invited different financial institutions in, when we were down to the last two, and we said to Key, will you hold real estate? And they said yes. We all said, what? And then we said, well, yeah, we hold real estate. That's not a problem for us. And we were just completely surprised because SunTrust didn't want to do it. Private trustees oftentimes don't want to do it because they see all the negatives. And if you look in these handouts over here, um, a trustee is concerned. There's a couple of them, buying a house for special needs beneficiaries. We look at it and we say, we love the idea of the trust owning the property. Because that means that the person has a permanent home and there's oversight over it and we know the bills are getting paid. We think it's a really good thing if there's sufficient funds to do that. But, the, but it's also important to look at the, the concerns and what could happen. And one of those things is depleting a trust rapidly because there weren't sufficient funds to pay for that property, right? That's, that's the number one concern. The, the effect on SSI, Supplemental Security Income, 
That's that's a concern for some people. The difference between seven hundred and fifty dollars and five hundred dollars could be a lot for some people, right? And it is a lot for some people, but again, that's why it's important that the trust has sufficient funds to maintain that helm and pay for those other expenses that need to be paid for. We've also, <laughs> we've also heard horror stories from um, attorneys who have been the trustees of trusts and the people living in courts. Then all of a sudden you have squatters. Yes. You own the home and seven other people move in with you uninvited and getting them, getting those people out of the house. And that has occurred. But I think with the, with the oversight that we provide along with key, that's not going to, that's not going to be happening. We're going to make sure that there's a, a regular check-in. There has to be a regular check-in, at least quarterly if it's an outside managing property manager, to make sure. And then um, what I've seen, we've received trusts from other financial institutions where, remember I said there's a million dollar minimum, the trust become, quote, too small, and the bank doesn't want to manage it anymore because it's too costly. They're not earning enough off of that trust and they don't want to manage it anymore. And what we've seen on a couple of those trusts that we've received were also that they had purchased homes and used the funds, but there weren't sufficient funds to keep up that house. So there's a, a different level of oversight whenever it's the ARC working with key private bank and their real estate team because they have this whole due diligence process they have to have to go through, as opposed to if it's a financial institution that's the trustee, they may not have the same level of due diligence. They may not be going in to say, can we make, is, it, is there, are there sufficient funds to maintain and keep this home and keep the property? And those are actually a couple of the trusts, yes. So when you were talking about sufficient funds, if you have a $400,000 house, how much do you have to have in that trust to maintain it? Right. So right now, Key says 80% of the value of the home. And we're talking to Key about that because we're in, in the area that we're in, housing is very expensive. And so if the home is paid off, does it really need to have 80% in addition to? So that would be, what, 3.3 million, right, in the trust or something to think? That doesn't, that doesn't, seem to make sense for us because they're looking at it without any of the benefits in place. They're not looking at supplemental security income or social security disability insurance that the person is receiving, the waiver services that are going into it. So maybe there are environmental modifications and assistive technology funds through the waiver that can be used to make updates to the home and whatnot. So we're talking to them about getting a number, a lesser, a lower number that seems it's more reasonable and then affordable as well because it's 80% of the value of the home is a lot of money. A lot of money. Any questions? So this one talks about the payback provision. So again, if it's a first party trust, there's a payback provision on there. The Medicaid payback. Family funded, there's not. Looking at being able to adapt the home, so that's something that we look at too, and you would be looking at the beneficiary to make sure that they can actually maneuver in that house and maintain that house, and is it a good piece of property that can be updated so they can actually age in place. So when we bought our house back in the day, we bought a split foyer thinking, one of the reasons why we bought the house that the girls and I now live in is because of the split foyer. They could have separate apartments upstairs and downstairs, right? One age and separate apartments. Well, now they're older and one doesn't want to live with the other, you know, 19 and 24, so we have a little bit of this going on with girls. But that, you know, it seemed like a good idea. Now, for adaptability purposes, the downstairs, quote, apartment that could be made, that would be okay because it's ground level and they can come in the back door and do it. But upstairs, they would, whoever was living upstairs would really have to be mobile, right? Because you have to go up steps to get up there. So that wasn't something we thought about at the time. Now, both my girls are mobile. There's ways to get into it. You can get in one of those chair lifts and things like that. But those are things that, that have to be thought about. I've actually seen a property that has, they raised the entrance so that there's a, a porch, they call it a porch lift. So it's like a little, little mini elevator on the porch, 
and the person goes in there and they're brought up and then they can enter that way. Instead of putting an elevator in the home, which is much, much more expensive. It was less expensive to renovate and put the steps in. Should the trust borrow money to purchase the home? This is one of the questions that gets asked. There are reasons why it's not, there are good reasons to do it, and then there are bad reasons to do it. So it's not countable income for SSI or Medicaid eligibility, and the receipt of loan proceeds will not affect monthly benefits. That's good news, right? But the money doesn't belong to the beneficiary then, and that mortgage has to be paid off. So again, you have to make sure there's sufficient funds coming in in order to pay off the home. And with the if it's in the first party, Medicaid payback. Third party, we don't have that problem. And then who can live in the home? So whenever there's supplemental security income, SSI says that you have to divide the expenses by the number of adults living in the home. So when we have three people living in a space, we have somebody in the group home, and the group home writes to us and says, we'd like to get living room furniture for the group home, we write back and say, how many people are in the group home? The trust will pay for one quarter of that living room furniture. So maybe then the individual gets a recliner instead. But the trust, when there's SSI involved, should be paid for paying for everybody's, everybody's furniture, right? And this, this document refers a lot to the first party trusts, by the way. And then the decision to, to sell, um, the sale of the proceeds, again, when it's in trust, whether it's first or third party, it's going to stay within the trust. And I don't know anything about taxes. Somebody asked me, what if it's in trust and it gets sold? Is there a property tax or, or, or sales tax? Or, you know, I don't even know what the proper terminology is. Right? You have to, after a couple of years, you have to pay something if you haven't reinvested the money in the property. I'm not sure what happens when it's in trust. I don't know. I would think that it doesn't affect anything because it's in trust, but I don't know. So I'll have to ask our CPA what happens if that's if somebody's bought and sold. Yeah. Is the individual required to live in the home, or can you simply use it for rental income? You can use it for rental income. So we have. Um, individuals that are interested in, they have rental properties in California, and the, they're going to be putting the rental properties in the trust as well. So Keyword will oversee those too. So. Yeah, so that does make a big difference as well. That's a good question because if the property were outside of the trust and the individual owned it and it was in their name, and they're living in it, and they have SSI and Medicaid, SSI doesn't care because they're living in it. But if that individual moves out of that property and is living somewhere else, it's now become an asset. And that will affect their supplemental security income. Whereas if it's in the trust, it doesn't matter if they're in the home or not, living or not, when it comes to SSI. We may be concerned if they're not living in the home when it was bought for them, we're going to say, where are they? Yes. But if it's a rental, it still has to be paid off. Right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a newer relationship with Key. We've been with them since September of 2016, so we have two years behind us. And we only have a couple of properties at this point. And it's kind of exciting for us to see and go through the process and see what happens. Because every trust is a person, really. And every situation is different. So there's a lot of steps involved before before you actually purchase something. What does Key get out of it? How do they get paid? There's a management fee. So they have their man, their trustee fee, I should say. So in the orange packet, there's trust information. It's also their information in there. So the, man, the trustee fee is 0.9% of the corpus of the trust. Our management fee is 0.75. So it's 1.65% of the corpus of the trust is how we get paid and how they get paid. They don't charge for any of this other stuff that they're doing. The only time they charge beyond the 0 0.9 is if they're selling or buying, and then it's 1 to 2%. But other than that, it's the straight fee that they have. And we're, we're starting after the holidays to negotiate with them because now we have over 26 million in the trust, 
and as it grows, we're asking them to reduce their fees. And so that will be across the board, we're hoping. Other questions? So a lot of parents are talking about this as ways to be able to afford a home for their kid with disabilities, working with other families, buying it together, or, or getting the home and putting it in there, and, and talking to other families. So Joe and Bob and Tom are going to move in, and we're going to have the house, and they're going to be paying rent, so that's going to be going toward the, the home and going toward maintenance. So there's going to be a steady stream of income going into the trust from those people renting it. Like our place, my thought was with the girls that they would have partners. I'm always hoping they're going to fall in love with somebody and they're going to have or even friends. I don't care. Somebody else move in. But there's enough space for five people to live in that house or six, right? So that would be a good stream of income to have. And that's part of the equation as well. Again, I think he's looking at it, they're looking at it outside of that as saying 80% is what we need to have, not taking into consideration potentially rental from, the, you know, it could be a couple of thousand or 1,500, depending on how many people you have in there, in addition to the individual living in that house as a street income. I'm trying to think, nobody has questions. I'm trying to think of what questions people are asking me in our. In our it doesn't seem like families joining together to buy a place could be put in trust. Somebody would have to have it in the trust and then rent it to the others. Well, families could buy it together and put it into the trust, but there's going to be the question of whose trust, right? And so then that, that, get, that can be dicey, yeah, right? Unless you know, I don't know. They would have to, I don't know what would have to be in place to make sure that that happened. There has to be a lot of trust, obviously, involved. Yeah. If a guardian is something with a trust, um, it, should that be a family-funded or a self-funded trust? So the question that you want to ask is, from where is the money coming? Mm -hmm. Is it the beneficiary's money? That's the self-funded, or is it anybody else's money? That's the family funder. So the guardian could potentially set up either, but where's the money coming from? Okay. So if it's a structured settlement, that's a first party trust, right? If somebody had an accident and sued and they won. But if it's your, um, if it's a life insurance policy and your will, that goes into the family. Okay. So do you don't 